Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the continuation of our very special Friday evening celebrations and tonight's inaugural Fellow Friday. I'm very excited, y'all. My name is Sharon Poli, and I am the executive director of the Fine Arts Work Center. We are committed to supporting artistic freedom, nurturing creative connections, and making possible artistic achievements that are important to the larger culture. This evening is so special because tonight, we turn the keys over to the fellows who have been in residence with us since October, and we are so excited to see and hear what they have to share with us. From now until April 19th, we will host a series of Friday evening gallery openings exhibitions, artist talks, and readings. A full schedule is at the back of the room and we hope that you'll come back and join us for each and every event. So before we transition to tonight's reading, I invite you all to give Jeff Gibbons, Visual Arts Fellow, a round of applause for his exhibition. <laughs> Woo! Jeff's show, Mush Womb to Mush Tomb, is on view in the Hudson D. Walker Gallery. And if you have not already had the chance to check out the work, I highly encourage you to do so. Congratulations, Jeff. I like it. Just a little extra woo, just to go. Um, so tonight, I also look around the room, and I notice we have some very special guests in attendance that I just want to take a moment to recognize. I would love to invite everybody here to join me in welcoming and saying thank you to Ed Miller, Teresa Parker, and the Provincetown Independent Team. <laughs> As media across the country continues to shut down, and there are layoffs, and just the most disheartening media landscape in the world, all of us are so lucky to live in a community where we have such vibrant writers, and stories to keep us all connected to one another. So huge thank you to the P-Town Independent. Yeah, let's do it again. Josh is... Um, so as we care for one another in community tonight, I just want to remind all of us that COVID and other winter illnesses are still with us. And so there are masks at the back of the room for anyone who would like one. And thank you to the Fox staff, including Naya Bricker, Josh Willis, D'Angelo Nieves, Jerome Green, Susan Blood, and others who make all of our work possible. Thanks to everyone. All right. Now I have the honor of inviting writing fellow Adeniyi Adamaroti to the stage to introduce our readers tonight. Thank you, Niyi. Hi. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'm not sure how introductions work, so I'm just going to like, jerk off my friend for <laughs> one or two minutes. Um, if I had to describe Lindsay's work in one word, the word would be clever. <laughs> Sorry. It's a joke. Um, Lindsay, doesn't, Lindsay really doesn't like that word. Um, Lindsay has described herself and her work as genre confused. Our writing straddles the line between poetry and nonfiction, a blessing truly for our readers. She has the startling language of a poet and the patient insight of an essayist. It is why she's able to write something like this from a chat book titled Edo Trout. Edo Trout is wet for the drive through northwestern Ontario, stopping to meet a friend in a town that swells in the summer, cottagers mostly. She counts the people with money, pokes herself in the eye. Fake her, wash your hair, mend your clothes. Clothing tears at the joint or it unravels, with or without speed. Bao Rang writes that beauty is the slow approach of her life things. She and her friend are walking. They take the tall grass by the river to a nearby tavern. It is what we call the, garden hour, the golden hour. The river is down to a thread, shudder. Our work is lyrical, sentences that take a surprising turn and are far from cliche. 
She is fascinated by and looks closely at, at the natural world, setting her characters herself on long walks and drives across North, uh, across North America, all the while digging into the psyche as she explores her themes of self-pity, gender, and alcohol use. But there is no self-pity in the work itself. Her fragments are cutting and severe, revealing hidden truths in the self. She self-describes as anxious in person, but on the page she's open and gutsy. We're lucky to hear her read tonight. Um, Lindsay Mouse is a writer based in Toronto. She started as a poet and is the author of two poetry track books, Edo Trout and a, po and a Period of Non-Enforcement. Her writing has, a, has appeared in the Capinano Review, Grain, Poetry is Dead, Bad Nudes, Plenitude, and elsewhere. She holds an MFA from the University of Guelph. Welcome, Lindsay Miles. Hello, is that good? <laughs> uh, that was such a nice surprise, oh my gosh. I was like, I thought you were just gonna say clever and then walk off and I was like, all right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that introduction and to Sharon and to everyone at Bach for putting this delightful evening together. And thank you Abigail Sharp and Jeff Gibbons for being just like amazing and having sharing in this showcase and showing some of your exceptional work tonight. Uh, here at Falk, I've been working on a book-length essay, a Meditation on Self-Pity. Other themes and threads include grief, gender, alcohol, physical and metaphorical spirals, TV, reality TV specifically, and uh, bugs and worms. So it's, yeah, it's all over. <laughs> this reading will pull from the beginning, middle, and end of the manuscript in progress. I hope you enjoy and uh, am I good volume-wise? You all can hear me? Okay, okay. I just don't have a sense. <laughs> How to write something that does not trade in some form of self-pity. Self-pity can be defined as sympathetic sorrow for one's own suffering, distress, or unhappiness. Further definitions imply underlying behavior that is attention or help-seeking, and a sense of suffering is at least partially unnecessary or exaggerated. To believe one has suffered more than is just or reasonable. To think this and feel immobilized by it, bent to resemble a spiral. Medium.com instructs, self-pity is anathema to reality, a reality presumably too positive or at least too complex for self-pity to accommodate. The self-pityer is somewhere else. As for where, I move between images, early mornings asphyxiated by fog, insulation with its eerie resemblance to animal flesh, the murky soup at the base of wheat gold cut flowers, I find a short poem by D.H. Lawrence. I never saw a wild thing sorry for itself. A small bird will drop frozen dead from a bough without ever having felt sorry for itself. I'm not entirely sure what to do with this. In the 1978 song Self-Pity, Dutch singer, pianist, and guitarist Marguerite S. House sings, the tears that flow are not real. That decade she performed as part of a pop group. They called themselves Lucifer. The kingdom of the self sits opposite the kingdom of heaven, is arguably heaven's greatest competitor. Money and status by room, but for everyone else, the masses, the principal stands. Anytime we are focused on ourselves other than for self-examination leading to repentance, 1 Corinthians 11.28, 2 Corinthians 13.5. We are in the territory of the flesh. Our sinful flesh is the enemy of the spirit. Romans 8.7. Eight, Eight minutes on foot from the town's psychic, I set off to ask her what she thinks about self-pity. I find the doors padlocked in three places with a sign call for appointment. Wet leaves line Commercial Street. Some of them retain their young color, browned only at the tips. Some are fully freckled, tinge of an orange base. I do not call for an appointment. 
Perhaps the impulse to consult a psychic, in my case, is the impulse to do so spontaneously. There is some value here I can't quite place. My paternal grandmother, my nana, died when I was seven years old. My maternal grandmother when I was 13. One died quickly, the other protracted over several years. One fought like hell, the other wore the dewy hue of acceptance. One was in a type of pain she would not or could not hide, an extraordinary electric pain. She took very few visitors, none of them children. She would not step back from the curation of her own memory. The Cambridge Dictionary uses this example. He faced his illness bravely and without any hint of self-pity. The family lore met one of my grandmothers with this valuative language and not the other who had worn her disgust and shame like a limp flag. She had shaken with it, and purportedly this was not brave. Really, she had not made the process easy on the people around her, and I believe this is the principal reason she was refused. This is speculation. I was not there. I did not suffer alongside her. Perhaps if I had, I would talk about bravery or its absence as well. The opposite of self-pity appears to be gratitude. American historian Laura Otis points to Walt Whitman as likely inspiration for Lawrence's self-pity, namely Song of Myself, 1892, a portion of which reads, I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. Turning to Reddit two years ago, Amazing Affect 5025 decides to ask women over 30, why is self-pity so looked down upon? She receives 18 responses. One of them includes examples. A solvent person who lives down the street from a shoe store who constant, constantly complains his shoes are falling apart or someone complaining about a dead bedroom to a recent widower. They elaborate. The inaction and or cluelessness are not sufficient to make it self-pity. There's also a certain tone to the complaint that I don't know how to convey. What is that tone? Why is it so difficult to convey? I think we're alone now, Tiffany karaoke version appears on the garish blue screen above the stage. That's my cue. Intoxication has done its dubious of work and the room loses some of its definition, inhabitants closer to interchangeable. I step onto the stage and grab the mic as the lyrics kick in. Children behave, that's what they say when we're together. Tiffany's full name is Tiffany Renee Darwish and she was 15 years old when that song came out. She had the type of cultish, cherished popularity with Canadian audiences that led me to wrongly believe she was Canadian herself. <laughs> Most of the music video for I Think We're Alone Now was shot in, sh shot in shopping malls across Utah. Every time I watch it, I'm back in the suburban city I grew up in, bored, the type of bored that hollows and drills, perched on cold plastic, guiding spoonfuls of fried rice or forkfuls of fries to my gaping maw. Tiffany and her muse pursue their shared solitude. They are in love and lust and no one gets it. She jogs and jerks before, below fluorescent lights. The audience jogs and jerks with her. The message is clear, we're happy, can't you see? We're happy here. One of the video's shots hints at an alternate ending. One minute and nine seconds in, we see two men, knees bent, arms splayed, adding a human component to the fence, separating Tiffany from the hordes of fans watching her perform. The expressions on the two men's faces are solemn, almost severe. They seem to be concerned, possibly for the performer's safety, their own safety, or both, or perhaps that solemnity that severity has origins outside of this moment, some other reality that the mall and the music cannot contain. It's a strange party. 
All the lights are on. Four people squeeze onto a couch that comfortably sits three. Several kneel or lay on the ground. There's leg wrestling and Japanese whiskey and a few crackers left at the bottom of the plastic tray. A game is played to induce confessions. No one bites, or at least I can't remember if we do. We're all horny. Most of us have partners on another planet. I'm pretty sure we're shouting, and it's affecting the neighborhood. The party began several years, <laughs> several hours. <laughs> like, ooh, I kind of like that version of her. The party began several hours earlier on a boat. Other than a cluster of Comorants, we were the only animals in sight. The pitier's lips can be open or closed, plump or taut, while the skin on the forehead gathers as if to talk strategy, boost morale. Eyes cloud, chin, chin tucks in toward its compatriot, the neck. Chin dimples to resemble the stone of a peach or plum. Whole head may tilt right or left, or it may not. However, the overall direction of the look must be down. It helps if you're tall or in possession of a stepladder or stool. Tears are not necessary, and in fact may overwhelm the look and intimate the presence of additional, more complex emotions like guilt. It does not hurt to include your hands, for example, palms together as in prayer or open and up in disbelief. Pityers do not typically touch the objects of their pity unless interested in the walk over to compassion. The gulls signal activity for those of us above water. They see it before we do. They circle increasingly frantic as the bubbles on the ocean surface grow in quantity and diameter. The gulls are bold. One even braves a moment's perch on a humpback's crowning chin. The humpback whales, six of them, appear unfussed by the avian commotion. They glide, mouths agape, before plunging seconds later back below the ocean's upper edge. I join the excursion ravenous and feed on the spectacle of feeding, the spectacle of need, the spectacle of the margins of what I can actually see. I imagine some friends growing up, Gomai and Teptep. They were twins from the planet Zorgon. I was also, as I saw it, from there. Origins are by necessity imagined, memory a matter of deferred development and story. The imagined twins had distinct personalities, the details of which I cannot recall. When the urge to return home overtook one or more of us, we'd climb inside an empty cardboard box and shuffle down my childhood home's carpeted hallway towards the stairs. My mother would intervene when she could, tell me I was going to break my neck sending myself down the stairs like that. Thankfully, that never happened. I could not imagine a world in which we took off. I pass the psychic and her purple doors are open. Half off, limited time only. I sit down on one of two armchairs and present her my dominant hand. She gazes down as she speaks. She's concerned. What am I doing to protect myself? It's not the first time a psychic has identified an issue with my throat. She cannot offer me solutions, not at this price. She gives me her card. When anyone gives me this kind of gentle, sustained attention, I want to fall asleep in their lap. I'm drowsy as I step back into the busy street, tempted to spend 500 US dollars to cleanse my aura. I might too, if I didn't know that too would end, and quickly. Before I knew it, I'd be back outside those plum doors, warm, but alone, egregiously, insolvably alone. Mine is the self-pitying cry of one who resents being deemed a woman, to adopt and amend the words of an American reviewer on Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Why don't I do something about it, you might ask? Transition to a different gender out of the gender binary altogether. Strangely, doing something about it, in my case, feels beside the point. 
as though the damage is already done, and now I live a perverse allegiance to it. I'm picturing someone who, having recently undergone bariatric surgery, is met with a sudden surplus of skin. What to do with all this skin? And the fact that playing each other in pool, my friend knows how to distract me. He leans in close and whispers, you're the man of my dreams. I blush and miss the shot. Anna Zabo is a Christian life coach who helps women see themselves the way God sees them. She scraps toxic positivity, embraces the healing power of self-pity. I try. <laughs> I try and fail to watch Zabo's September 2020 TEDx talk on the subject. I am not at or above the level of Anna's spiritual squad. For $2,000, I can purchase the premium package. 10 60-minute phone calls, 10 emails, one assignment each, five weekly assessments of my progress, and three text, mes text messages a day for a five-week period. On the day I was planning my suicide, Anna Zabo writes, the waitress who served me lunch said I looked sophisticated, projected confidence, and appeared to have my life together. It wasn't as fun, like it's funnier now. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably complete strangers sh should be able to tell when I'm designing my own death. And I'm only designing such a death because ironically, I've not permitted myself the full complement of my own pain, the whole wicked or orchestra of individual and collective trauma and loss. Presumably once I do, I will hear my reason to live. The opposite of self-pity appears to be suicide. I'd been thinking the pain unbearable, the suffering sufficiently sharp and senseless to depose me for good as I stepped out the door of my third floor apartment directly into two gusts of wind, which proceeded to pat me on both the right hip and the left. In the past, when I've grown this morose, I've repeated the word rhododendron to myself. Rhododendron, rhododendron, rhododendron. Perhaps something in the internal rhyme or the sheer number of syllables steers me out of myself and into a meaninglessness, shallow and benign, an improvement from the malignant sort I've been entertaining since the previous day. Rhododendron, rhododendron, rhododendron. Walking the block down to the beach, I hear the playful warring shrieks of gulls, the remote chiming of presumably a bell and a person gently reprimanding their dog. I see the protrusion of a lighthouse. On days like this, I am a net of nerves, a jellyfish who wishes only to be a fox by the name of Todd living on or around the tarmac of a small regional airport. I wake up, it is still dark, thinking I hear a person inside my apartment flicking all five of the lamps on one by one proceeding back in the direction they came to flick these lamps one by one off before beginning again. Without light to substantiate the notion, I'm left imagining this person unplugged the lamps or pocketed the bulbs. In my mid-twenties, I would see a stout figure in a safety vest at the foot of my bed, figuring he used to live in the same dent of a room. Abolish the term garden level. If you're a landlord of such a suite, you're admit you're putting people in the ground. I often assume that ghosts were before death drunks. Drunks seem more inclined to haunt. Perhaps it's the sheer number of idle hours poured into one place. Perhaps it's the propensity to misspeak, overstep. Perhaps they've decided truth is worth waiting for and haunting a crack at amends. Worms like bugs are bound up with self-pity. The word worm can be traced back through the Old English wyrm, meat-eating snakes, mythical dragons, to the Proto-Indo-European root were, to turn, to bend. Worm was also used to signal a pathetic, a pitiable person. 
Grit, a bi-monthly rural lifestyle magazine, tells me to pity the first person who noticed an earthworm at their feet. Earthworms are intersex skin breathers. Their hearts, five pairs of them, reside near their mouth. They require moisture. They cannot live without it. I was a lesbian for a while, you know. Maintain Rosamund Pike's character, Elspeth Catton in Saltburn. But it was all a bit too wet for me in the end. <laughs> Men are so lovely and dry. After viewing trans artists carry Downey's wormholes, I find myself researching the uncommon skill and profession of worm charming. My own digital wormhole, my own space-time split. Also known as worm grunting or worm fiddling. Worm charming <laughs> encompasses a variety of methods designed to lure worms to the surface of the soil to collect bait for fishing or as a competitive sport. Tools such as wooden stakes or stops, dulled saws, rooped irons, and garden forks allow these charmers to produce vibrations in the soil, vibrations that encourage earthworms nearby to muscle their way skyward as if on the run from a burrowing mole. Most of the worm charming championships and festivals occur in the UK. The rise in climate change induced heat waves has made earthworms less inclined to be charmed. The lesson was very much, don't get divorced. Stay in situations that are unbearable. Watch how the colors change, each win winter more difficult than the last, which, as one gets older, makes more and more sense. For escape is a youthful enterprise. It requires a level of energy and a degree of self-delusion not eternally available. With each passing year, tasks, activities, however mundane, appear to require more and more steps. At turns jittery and bloated with gas, there is a matter of an oil change. Preparations for this holiday or the next, the unbearable growing gradually, imperceptibly favorable to the inconvenient. This is not intended to engender fear in those younger than myself or derision in those older, though I've accepted that it may accomplish one or both of these things. The lesson was very much don't, very much stay, and they were good, weren't they? They didn't, they stayed less and less convinced of their own abilities to survive the fallout of a social contractual breach of this size and magnitude. Something as invisible as shame can become like an impotent chimney in your house, a person, personal monument to the costs of so-called freedom. Because really, divorce is destruction, and destruction is creation, and creation is how we got here anywhere in the first place. The key to the spiral is the fixed center, the eye or axis. The spiral's plight is a continuous one, ever edging away or toward, depending on how you look at it. Movement is inscribed, implied, the feeling of motion without motion itself. The spiral is a degenerate case, a class of galaxy marked by a central concentration of stars known as a bulge. From the spiral, one is denied the illusion of unfettered agency, free will. One senses a formula, someone singing again, but wider. Upon rupturing an eardrum, one can expect a surge of pain, followed by the installation of a feeling of claustrophobia within the ear, a shattering that is also a softening. It will hurt to laugh. From the attic, a warm wind, a whistling, genuine opening where one stood only its impression. I suppose with the proper instruments, one could see clean through to my spiral, which is danger, which is a danger, of course. It is easy to see the opportunity here. Pain puts me on a crowded elevator with everyone in it concealing somewhere in them one or two compelling performances of pity I'm anxious to see. I watch a seagull peck a crab to death by way of its stomach. Everyone has a weak spot. 
flipping it by a leg to render it soft and immobile, commencing the feast while the crustacean is still alive and wagging its limbs. I watch just, ja just gestural size and force diminish until I'm watching a crab's terminal twitch. I'm watching stillness, nothing at all. The seagull has taken a life and replaced it with a cavity. I watch the crab enter a realm of ine inedible exteriors, the beach, where I am latest in a line of large and idle guests. I feel as if I'm in someone's cold and ordinary home. Seaweed, someone's sodden carpet. We eat runny soup and play with cards designed for the visually impaired. Or perhaps their size is a gag, rendering us outlandish and small. It is somebody's birthday. Of the few options for lighting, tonight's selection borders on clinical. It's hot. Several of us fan ourselves with our shares of the clownish deck. There's the intermittent traffic of smokers and rice of the Iranian kind that you altogether flip, meant to retain the shape of the pot it was cooked in. I'm reminded of the cranberry sauce I consumed at my grandma's as a kid, which wore the ridges of its former tin. I resented the moment inevitable when someone picked up a spoon and brought it down on the stiff cylinder. I resented the fall, the mash, like it was a cover-up, immutable damage to the historical record. This is the game that never ends. When I suggest a friend is exhibiting self-pity, he turns to correct me. He does not really feel it, you see. It's a moving picture, a show. 